Hello and welcome, everybody. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural event of a new partnership between the Carla Scherer Center for the Study of American Culture at the University of Chicago and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. I'm Eric Slaughter. I'm the faculty director of the Carla Scherer Center, and I am grateful to our partners at the Seminary Co-op, especially Clancy de Issa, and to Tara Rutledge at the Share Center for their help in launching this series. Our aim in the series is to discuss important new books with their authors and to focus, as we often do at the Share Center, on both the substance of a book and the process of its making. A book's topics and themes, of course, but also its sources and methods. Both the what and the how of a book as our first guest has described it. You'll have a chance to join the conversation later this, this evening by sending questions through the Q&A function. And you'll also have an opportunity to acquire the books we feature with a special discount through the Seminary Co-op. Information about that and about upcoming events in this series will be made available through the links in the chat. Today, I am grateful to be joined by Robert A. Gross. Bob earned a BA at Penn and studied American history as a graduate student at Columbia. In 1976, he published his first book, The Minutemen and Their World. This book, a version of which he also submitted that year as his dissertation at Columbia, where it bore the more prosaic title, Population, Economy, and Society in Concord, Massachusetts, 1720 to 1800, that book would earn the Bancroft Prize in 1977. A dazzling example of what was then called the new social history, the book also bore the distinct marks of a true literary stylist, someone who could highlight unknown people and voices and make the past speak to us in a new way. Part of this gift was honed when Bob served as an assistant editor at Newsweek. When the publishers, Hill and Wang, brought out a 25th anniversary edition of The Minutemen in Their World, they tapped a who's who of early American historians to help promote it. Alan Taylor called it, quote, the single most important work in shaping my sensibility as a historian in a new forward. And on the back cover, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich observed that, quote, for historians, The Minutemen and Their World was a shot heard around the world. It taught us that fine history combines good scholarship with good writing. Its reverberations are still being heard today. Indeed, the book was a crucial predecessor to both Ulrich's A Midwife's Tale and Taylor's William Cooper's Town, books that would earn their authors Pulitzer Prizes. Since the 1970s, Bob has held appointments at Amherst, at William and Mary, and most recently at the University of Connecticut, where he is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Professor of Early American History Emeritus. He has published numerous articles and books, as well as articles on books, such as Books and Libraries in Thoreau's Concord. With Mary Kelly, he co-edited An Extensive Republic, Print, Culture, and Society in the New Nation, 1790 to 1840, the second volume of the history of the book in Amer of a history in the book of in America published um, jointly with the American Antiquarian Society. Since retirement, he has returned to Concord, where we find him today, a place that has occupied his attention for five decades. The result is the book we'll discuss and which he'll read from tonight, The Transcendentalists and Their World. Welcome, Bob, and congratulations on the book. Thanks. I wanted to give our audience, now that I've um, bragged about what a great writer you are, I wanted to give our audience a chance to um, taste a little bit of the book at the beginning. And so you've um, graciously agreed to read a few passages that give us a, what I think is a different kind of glimpse at two of the key players in the book. Uh, first, Henry D. Thoreau, and then Ralph Waldo Emerson. Great. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks to Seminary Co-op bookstore for featuring the book. And what I'm about to read to you is the first thing you'll encounter if you go right to the prologue and skip the preface. Early in August, 1822, 
A Boston schoolmaster and his wife gathered up their four young children for a trip to the country. Their destination was Concord, 16 miles west of the city in a four hour journey by stage. The weather was perfect for the expedition. So fine, clear and cool, one newspaper noted that the usual toll of deaths in the hot season was surprisingly light and the crops in the fields and orchards promised an abundant harvest. The children, ranging in age from nine to three, were undoubtedly excited by the open rural landscape. So unlike their neighborhood atop Beacon Hill with its continuous row of houses and brick lined streets. The highlight of this outing was not the farms under cultivation, but rather a pond in the woods a mile from Concord Center. A scene seemingly so solitary and untouched by man that it caught the imagination of the five-year-old boy in the little entourage and aroused a lifelong love of the wild. Nearly a quarter century later, he would remember that day as a turning point in his life. That woodland vision for a long time made the drapery of my dreams, Henry David Thoreau recalled, not long after taking up residence by the shores of Walden Pond in the summer of 1845. Somehow or other, it once gave the preference to this recess among the pines, where almost sunshine and shadow were the only inhabitants that varied the scene over that tumultuous and varied city, as if it had found its proper nursery. The encounter would prove fateful, not just for the aspiring writer, for, but for the place where he dwelled. It was a signal moment in the making of Concord, Massachusetts into a literary landmark, and of Thoreau, its native son, into an enduring force in American culture. Now, if you keep reading, make your way through the next eight chapters, you'll come to part, the opening of part two, Freedom of Mind. And this is the opening paragraph. Ralph Waldo Emerson was a man at loose ends early in October, 1834, when he arrived at his stepfather, step-grandfather Ripley's home and moved in. At 31, the scion of six generations of New England ministers, going back to Peter Buckley, had not yet become the sage of Concord or anywhere else. Nor was the house the legendary old man's that would be conjured up by Nathaniel Hawthorne a dozen years later. Emerson came to Concord in large part because he had nowhere else to go. That's wonderful. Thank you, Bob. So those give us um, inaugural moments, uh, moments where, where um, two of the protagonists, but by no means the only protagonists in, the, in this uh, in this wonderful book, get a glimpse of Walden or, or return to Concord. I'd like to talk about your first time in Concord um, to take you back a, a bit. Readers who know that um, you wrote Minutemen, the readers of Minutemen, will think of this book as a kind of sequel. But in that 25th anniversary preface that or afterward that I that I mentioned, you actually confess that it was the period that you write about in the early 19th century, the 1825 to 1850 period that really first ignited your imagination. Can you take us back to that story? Why was that story so key to you? And what's changed in your approach to this period over time? So I was working on a dissertation for Columbia University on what was pretty prosaically called population, land and economy in Concord Mass. And it was gonna be a work of the new social history, picking up in the early Republic on themes that have been de developed by other historians in the 17th and 18th century New England towns. I hadn't thought of when I conceived the project initially Walden at the center of it and Emerson and transcendentalism key to the work. I was kind of asking questions like if there had been um, demographic pressure on the available resources of land, what they do after the revolution? And if families were under tension, did they start getting along any better afterwards? So that was kind of the idea. And I ended up working on the Minutemen because as the bicentennial approached, people would come to visit 
and I'd keep taking them to Minuteman National Park. And I, my, I'm far more often than I took them to Walton. So this told me something. So I worked on that. But there was a further thing, which is the real story of why I ended up doing both books. And that is I talked to a man named David Little who had been born and brought up in Concord. I didn't know this at the time. And was then the director of the Essex Institute in Salem, Massachusetts. He had hosted a conference on the new social history around 1971 or two. And when I moved up to Massachusetts, I sought him out. I had this long list of towns that I thought had gone downhill. I was greatly interested in the history of American failure at the time, <laughs> which might have been the result of my dissertation if I'd done it on this subject. But um, so I showed him the list and it was a list of communities that lost population in two decades from 1790 to 1860. Concord was on there. And David scanned the list and he said, huh, why don't you study Concord? It was his, if I was with- Was it an alphabetical list? No, it just, <laughs> I'm not sure what it was. You now, it, it might've been by the most population loss, but you know, it was like Proust eating a Madeleine. I just like said, you know, instantly I thought, why would you study a place that was just going to be average and representative. And it hit me that all the communities that people like Philip Grevin and Demos and others had studied, their books were fascinating, but nobody could remember the name of a single person who lived there because they were case studies. And at that moment I thought, study a place as if it was a case study, but it was also consequential what happened there mattered. So studying the Minutemen and then studying the Transcendentalists as it happened in that sequence um, made much sense to me because I could write about places that meant that I was writing about American history as a whole, even as I could burrow into a single place and try to give a sense of the lived experience of people there. So, um, that begs your question, we can come back to in a minute, of how doing the one, the early one, shaped the latter. And I think the key thing is that I ended up having a much deeper sense of New England culture and of the historical under, um, consciousness and the civic identity of the people in Concord, who were, after all, in the revolutionary period, the fathers and grandfathers, mothers and grandmothers of the generation that would respond to Emerson in Concord and that would come up with Thoreau. That's wonderful. I mean, uh, readers who will encounter this book, I hope soon, will recognize that the second passage you read about Emerson comes about midway through the book, uh, around page 300. We don't really get to Emerson until around 300. Thoreau is threaded throughout the, the book. We see him in the prologue, but then his real life is starts around 450. So this is this is a very long prologue that you you give us. And what you've effectively done is combine social history with cultural history. It strikes me that many who deal with the transcendentalists tend to be scholars of cultural history, literary history. I think it's mostly English professors who are reviewing the book right now. Um, and you tap them for all sorts of things. But I'm just sort of curious, as a historian, what's different about the way in which you approach this subject? Okay, well, first, let's just think for a moment of Walden or think of Emerson's essay. They are as sprawling in their reach, in their attempts to interpret the life all around them, as I am. Um, and what I mean by that is that a lot of literary scholars understand Concord, understand New England, through the Emersonian gaze or the Grovian gaze. Concord is, for many literary scholars, what Emerson or Thoreau talked about. 
But even as if we want to engage in kind of close reading and literary interpretation, what if Emerson and Thoreau took partisan views of the life around them? What if they saw some things and not others? Wouldn't it be important to know how they select out of the life around them to craft their own works? So it wasn't that I sat down thinking, what's everything in the world I can throw into this book? It was more, how could I take the measure of Emerson and Thoreau's understanding of their New England world and understanding that produced their classic works, how can I take the measure of that? And so if, if Emerson is bringing to mind, though he doesn't give the name, an agricultural progressive reformer who was one of the richest guys in town, Abel Moore, who was Abel Moore? How would we understand him? Thoreau talks about a man named George Minot, who never bragged, he never took crops to market. Well, who was he? Why? How did Thoreau know him? So that was one key part of it. Uh, second is a lot of uh, literary scholars and actually a lot of historians tend to write about organizations and people for the big generalization that flattens out change over time. And it matters, it seems to me, when things happen to get at why they happen. Think, for example, how I set up Emerson in, in that opening of, of chapter nine in part two. He had no place else to go. He's just moving into Concord. Well, he publishes his book, Nature, in 1836, gives the American Scholar Address in 1837. And from 1837 to the mid-1840s, He's lecturing regularly in Boston and at like CMs in New England and also in Concord about the life around him. What's stunning is that when you read those lectures, he's working out almost all his major ideas that will be crystallized in his essays, book one and book two. And when you pause and think about that, you think, huh? Look at his journals and his letters. He's, he's informed by the world around him in Concord. He's taking illustrations from the people he talks with, from the scenes he sees. And any of us who've moved to a new place can reflect on how attuned we are to what it's like the first few years we're there. So Emerson is articulating his vision of New England as it's changing in, in, in what he calls in the American Scholar Dress an age of revolution at the very moment that he's settling into Concord. And then you trace his, from his journals and letters to his lectures, and you see time and again, he's drawing on incidents that have happened in Concord. So I, I argue in the book, Concord didn't make Emerson and Transcendentalist. It didn't breed his point of view. He'd already read Coleridge and Carlyle and read Wordsworth and some of the German idealists and already come around to a new religious and social point of view. But he drew on the life around him in Boston and especially in Concord to make his case. And in that sense, it seems to me, we can locate Emerson and the explosion of transcendentalist thought far more clearly in the transformation of society and politics and economy. If you take the printed book, this is, was a problem for me for the longest time. You know, Walden comes out in 1854. Emerson's essays, 1841, 1844, uh, 45. Um, do you relate those publications to the circumstances of the mid 1840s or the mid 1850s? What a biographical and historical approach tells you, no, the transformations that happened long before. Um, Emerson's coming into Concord, you know, in, in act two and Thoreau's showing up in act three. So I had to figure out a structure and style to convey the story so that I didn't misinterpret the changes and attribute them all to a short period when Emerson and Thoreau come on the scene. 
And in fact, you take a you take them off the scene well before the 1850s. I think we last see Emerson in 1844 as he's giving an important anti-slavery speech, his first. We last see Thoreau in the final pages as he's spending a night in jail for, for um, what he says are political, political reasons. So maybe could you say a little bit about how you, not just where you started decided to start, but how you decided to, to end? Yeah, well, both are problems, right? So um, <laughs> a community has an ongoing history. How do you dive into the stream of time and, and say, oh, no, we begin here? And that's one of the reasons it took so long to do the book, because for the longest time, I thought it would be narrated from the 1790s on. But at the same time, when would you ever get to Emerson and Thoreau if you did that? Part of the problem was that the resources are so rich, and I was able to um, tell so many stories and, and follow so many patterns and events that if I started in 1790, it was just going to be impossible. It also wasn't clear what the destination date would be. So I decided it made sense to start essentially in the 1820s when uh, in this second version of the book, you would start with uh, in the mid 1820s and all kinds of things could be lined up there. This was really the takeoff to change when the uh, initiatives and, and signs of social change and conflict in the early Republic were really going to accelerate dramatically with the Industrial Revolution, with the Lowell Mills, with Jackson's presidency and the popularization of politics, with um, the breakup of the religious establishment and religious diversity and pluralism and so on. So I could start there. But where to end? And I realized if, you, if what I've just said about Emerson moving to Concord and taking its measure, if that makes sense, it was also true that biographically, Emerson was pretty much a New England figure until the mid 1840s. Thoreau, of course, doesn't graduate college until 1837 and, and he's not really publishing very much at all. But he leaves Walden in 1847. That's in a sense when I end the book with the first draft of, of Walden. And so I get them poised for national careers. And that's actually important in two ways. One is conquered by the mid to late 1840s is going through a shift in its economy in which it will become much more of a suburb and is increasingly envisioned by people as a bucolic retreat from the ur conflicted urban world of masses and impersonal um, uh, settings of factories and cities and the like. And so arguably Emerson has laid out his big ideas. He's had his creative original insights. When he goes national, he's applying these ideas as an activist. But it's not at all clear that he's changing his ideas in significant ways. Thoreau, by contrast, once he leaves Walden and, and rewrites and rewrites his manuscript, he's also training himself in a far more systematic way to be a naturalist, to be a natural scientist. And certainly the fields and streams and rivers and ponds of Concord are the environment in which he's doing so more than any place else. But the intellectual tools in which he, that he uses don't depend at all on Concord. They depend upon scientific developments in the Western world from France and London to, to um, Cambridge and Agassiz and Boston and the like. So I thought it made some sense that you've got some real coherence to this quarter century or so. It strikes me that one thing that a, that a historian brings to this story is not just um, the animating question of why did all of this happen in Concord, but why did it happen when it did? And so could you maybe speak to the sort of special circumstances of the 1830s that are producing what this book sees as sort of frayed social ties and, and all sorts of 
um, commotion. I mean, you really make this, this period look um, remarkably revolutionary and tra transformative in a way, I think, that hasn't been, um, hasn't been fully appreciated. So could you say a little bit about, you know, wh why then? Yeah, so- Say a lot about why there, yeah. Right, why then and why there, yeah. So there's both a kind of sociological argument, I think, that undergirds the book, but I'm also wanting to write narrative that shows you the people making decisions, initiating changes, and living through them, a sense of their lived experience. So let me give you first the kind of more abstract sociological case that I'm making, and then shift in a way to who the people are and what's happening. And, and in a broad sense, I would say that from the end of the revolution, um, the revolutionary generation is building on its, um, if you will, cooperative and corporate past. It has a way of life um, that I refer to repeatedly and that rests on um, uh, inclusive institutions and has a kind of ethic of interdependence to it. Uh, John Adams once suggested that there's a quartet of institutions that define the New England way. And he had in mind town government and town meeting, the religious establishment, the ideal of one town, one church, the militia in which able-bodied men were all required to train a few times a year um, with a few exceptions. But And then finally, common schools paid for by taxes where all the kids would go and you'd still sustain a grammar school to train the few who would all go and go on to Harvard and train for the ministry. Uh, we might add to this a couple more institutions um, in farming, the cooperative practices that farming neighbors engage in with one another, um, one of which is known as changing works in which I might borrow your plow and you would keep a record of what I owe you back for that. And um, you might, um, when you want me to pay up, I'll send my sons over to help you harvest your hay. So, you know, activities like that. In the country stores, people haggle with one another, um, with the storekeeper, and they're not necessarily the fixed price. And when you finally cut a deal, you would get a free drink. That leads to the other institution, which is the ale house, which is a place where people came. And they, they got the news at the tavern. They saw tra travelers coming through. They heard about the, uh, what's happening elsewhere. Um, and so, and yet, each of those had their own limitations. I won't detail them now, but nothing was as inclusive as claimed. But on the other hand, the ethic was there that this is a communal way of life. What happens after the revolution and increasingly from the 1820s on is people are pulling away from that. They're, they're opting to act on what was corporate collective liberty in the revolution, the defense of town government, and apply it more to their own lives for individual choice. You know, you had said to me, you know, one question you want to pose is, why is the book structured the way it is? And it's interesting that a key fissure in this Yankee way of life was the separation of people out from the common religious way. So you could sign off the meeting house and Baptists and Methodists and, and others were organizing their own congregations. Concord had actually successfully managed to sustain one town, one church ideal from the revolution to the mid 1820s. And one reason I started in the mid 1820s is that breakup. So what you have in the narrative of the book is an acceleration of changes in which people are pulling back from the common way of life. 1825, there's a split from Ezra Ripley's Rahul the Emerson's step-grandfather, the pastor of the town, from his religious establishment, and Orthodox Congregationalists and Evangelicals start their own crashing of the notion that a community is a place everybody worships together. You also have um, in education, the emergence of um, private academies where children of the privilege are now setting themselves off, setting off, being set off by their parents' desires from 
the village schools where the rowdies are there and, and um, maybe you can get better education too if it's much smaller classes. So you have that, you no know, common schools are under threat. So we could go through all this. Actually, the militia is an interesting thing. Um, people keep skipping, men keep skipping the militia duty and the trainings and they're hauled before the justice of the peace and they have to pay fines um, in the 1830s. And there's so much political pressure that in 1840, Massachusetts abolishes entirely the obligation of showing up for training. Just as in 1834, the obligation to show, to pay for the ministry is abolished. And I, the way I, I had, I thought about this when I wrote the book, I would say, add some of the militia stuff in and say, Massachusetts abolished the religious establishment and the military establishment at almost the same time. That's great. So, yes, I, 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 you know, as a reader of Minutemen, I think I was surprised when you brought up the quartet and we didn't see we didn't see the militia. One of the one of the things that um, you really bring out beautifully um, in talking about this transformed world is the role of women as agents in the transformation. They play roles in, in petitioning and politics, in the creation of new churches, in the economy, in various cultural organizations. And um, it's really astonishing the number of, of women and even young girls, both black and white, that we, that we encounter along the way in your narrative. Um, I think at one point you note that Mary Moody Emerson is the is the muse, the unacknowledged muse of transcendentalism that Elizabeth Palmer Peabody uh, may have coined the word um, in or been the first American to use the word in the 1820s. And then you say something like um, in the 1830s and early 1840s, social reform was a job not for the famous transcendentalists of Concord, but for their female kin, their mothers and aunts, sisters and wives. And I think there was a passage you were going to maybe um, point us to about one of those figures. Yeah, so this is an account of Henry Thoreau's mother, Cynthia Thoreau, and her involvement in the Concord Female Charitable Society, an organization started in 1814. Actually, Henry wasn't even born when it was started. Um, and um, started in 1814 by women of Concord. It was the 10th such organization in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, the first in Middlesex County. And I go through for a few pages uh, an inquiry into why would you start such a group? And uh, I, the obvious answer you think might be, well, it's conquered female charitable society. There must have been a great rise in poverty that gave rise um, gave and rise to the organization, gave a reason for its existence. Well, it turns out you can't really make that case. There's, if you look at the town's records, there's no great spurt in spending for the poor that is anyway aligned with the formation of the organization. And I end up arguing that the group is established because women want to act more forcefully in the world at large. And in this case, they want to act to relieve the wants of indigent women, to um, mothers of children. And most of the men, women who join the group are themselves in their early 40s, married with young children at home. And they're imagining the poor women um, who really need some support because their own children are not going to school and are, are not going to uh, public worship on the Sabbath because they don't have enough clothes to wear. And, they, and even if the kids would go, their parents would say, oh, you're not going to go. We don't want you to look, look shabby. So the group is organized for these purposes. And um, one of the questions I'm asking here is, what does forming the organization do for the members? You know, so often we're focused on the objects of reform that we forget that the organizations might be started to fill needs for the reformers. And so I go through this and I suggest that the activity in the organization um, does many things, but among them is it allows privileged people to 
choose objects of charity and personally give them support, sponsor them for the group. Um, this is not impersonal charity. Nobody's raising money to give to missionaries to convert to heathen. This is women in Concord who know of other women who are in need. So it's face-to-face, person-to-person charity. Whatever it did for the poor, the society rewarded benevolence. Cynthia Thoreau had good reasons to join. She knew what it was like to suffer a reversal of fortune and to need a helping hand. The unhappy fate of her mother following um, her mother's second husband, Jonas Minor's death. In like manner, the charitable society functioned as a mutual insurance policy for members in case they ever endured hardship. It enlisted women of every rank and order, from Daniel Shattuck's spouse, Sarah, all the way down to Miss Mary Minot, the hardworking tailoress clinging to threadbare gentility. The leadership came chiefly from the elite. In 1825, when Cynthia Thoreau assumed her duties, over half of the officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and nine managers were married to members of a group called the Elite Social Circle. While John Thoreau was never invited into the exclusive coterie of Concord's businessmen, politicians, and professionals, his socially ambitious spouse entered the genteel company of their wives. Participation in the charitable society made for upward mobility and helped to raise the Thoreau family's status in the town. That's wonderful. And it strikes me that the the structure of a question like what does X do for Y is is a really animating one for you. You see it in in that passage. Uh, what what did reform do for those who joined the reform movements? What did transcendentalism do for um, for Ralph Waldo Emerson? Where does that question come from for you? Maybe being an academic, <laughs> going to department <laughs> meetings and knowing the very few proposals are made by my colleagues wholly out of altruistic motives. Now, that could be different at the University of Chicago, where I know that abstract thought is, is a significant value. But, um, but I think, you know, that's a social historical question. You know, and, and it's not meant that, I mean, I'm not a muckraker. My goal is not to say, look at the seamy, sordid motives I've exposed on the part of people I study. Um, in fact, I will reflect back that there was a point in the 1980s as I worked on this book, when it was really big in the literary field as well as in history to say, um, oh, look at how Emerson is really complicit with capitalism, gotcha. And I probably was inclined, you know, following the crowd to gotcha moments. And I'm glad I didn't, you know, in the final book. Because, you know, that's more about us than about them. And so um, I wanted to know what draws people to them. That's both a story about large historical forces. You know, can't take Cynthia Thoreau. It may be that, you know, um, She'd seen what happened. Her mother, after her mother's second husband dies, um, she doesn't really have a lot of money to, to live on. The late husband was, um, in, his estate was insolvent. In any case, his children from his first marriage were the ones who really get the property. And her first husband had been a Mason. So they have to apply to the Masonic Lodge uh, for charity. And they get it. So maybe Cynthia Thoreau joins the Female Charitable Society because she knows what can happen. How one moment you're comfortable and the next year you're perched on a precipice. We certainly know that happens to millions of Americans today. But maybe being an officer of the group also allows her to, to distance herself from impoverished moments in her own existence. Maybe the association with elite figures in Concord as a fellow officer will in a sense upgrade her status. And while her husband is never elected 
into the social circle. Never asked to serve on a town committee, never uh, elected to any town office. She plays a public role in the town that is at one and the same time a means of promoting her Henry. There are numerous anecdotes in which she would never stop talking about my Henry. But, you know, it may have done him real good in winning the patronage of the elite when he opens his academy. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful. Um, the the kinds of facts you you encounter one, one a reader of this book encounters um, that are that were new to me, even as somebody who spent a lot of time with my Henry. Um, and uh, I I think you know we learned that. Thoreau voted. We, we, you have an idea about who he might have voted for. We learned that um, his financial aid at Harvard was uh, was uh, paid for by him collecting personally the um, the rents on estates in a in a town called Chelsea. Um, there are so many wonderful facts in here, and I thought I would just um, I thought as a way of getting into quantification in your work um, and the sort of legacies of the new social history that I would just um, report on some of those facts that you that you give us so and then we can maybe have a little conversation there's a there's a passage I think I'd love to have you read but early on we learned that a contemporary writer noted that over half of the residents in Concord didn't attend church we learn um, about a third of the way through that a merchant from Concord shipped uh, 1,060 bunches of onions to Haiti in 1823. Uh, we learn maybe 40% into the book that the social library of Concord, the Concord Social Library that uh, Thoreau satirizes in Walden, possessed one book for every two inhabitants in 1837, a fact that is meaningless until we throw it into the context of a, another county like Worcester, where the ratio was one to 10. Um, that 28 local residents delivered over half of the 143 lectures at the Lyceum, the Concord Lyceum, between 1829 and 1843. That the annual consumption of alcohol reached five five gallons per capita in this period, nearly three times what it is today. That no more than one out of three conquered voters actually cast ballots while John Quincy Adams was president. Um, that Emerson's lectures in 1837 and 1838 during a period of great depression attracted an average of 439 people and earned him about $57 a talk. And that by the 1810s, a mere 10 to 15 percent of all parents in Concord named children after themselves. Um, these are wonderful facts that really throw this world into relief. Um, and you discovered while you were writing that uh, that there were progenitors um, of the new social history that were present in Concord. Could you talk a little bit about that before you take us to this next passage? Sure. So challenge with those facts is we don't want them to be factoids. We want them to help open up the subjects in the world that I'm describing. And so you can't avoid all these various figures in Parker's as you were already quoting. Some of them estimates are made by people who lived at the time. And Concord, it turns out, as the home of uh, a native son, Edward, Dr. Edward Jarvis, and of Lemuel Shattuck, the brother of the storekeeper whose wife I mentioned in that previous passage, um, they were pioneers of quantitative study of past and present. And um, they were founders in 1845 of the American Statistical Association, um, which was based in Boston. That's pretty important. They, Lemuel Shattuck and Edward Jarvis, begin their work um, studying society and community quantitatively as reformers of schools in Concord and of drinking in Concord. 
those are the and of and Jarvis as um, a person active with the social library. He builds library collections for the Unitarian Sunday School and Shattuck as a promoter of the Lyceum movement. All movements notably emphasized in Walden and Emerson's work. Maybe a way to get at this is first describe Lemuel Shattuck. He grows up on a farm in, in New Hampshire. He's got very few options for himself. Has a little more than a district school education. Um, he finally gets to go to an academy for a term and he gets out by getting hired to teach schools. When he's in Troy, New York teaching school, he learns about this new method of schooling called monitorial education pioneered by the English uh, education was Joseph Lancaster. In a typical common school, you got 40, 50 kids put in this little one room schoolhouse and everybody studies their book. And then each kid goes and stands before the desk of the schoolmaster and recites and uh, ask questions while all the other 49 kids are bored as hell sitting there one by one by one. Lancaster comes up with this notion, especially in the new industrial cities of, of, of England, that kids can be grouped and classed at their level of knowledge. And so you have 10 in one group and 10 in the next higher group and 10 in the next higher group. And one child who's really a whiz and group three will be the leader of group two and so on. And kids will compete with one another to move up. This is a system of education with prizes and rewards and competition orchestrated by the schoolmaster as if he was running a factory with all these units. And it was promoted as a way to educate the poor and working class children in mass education. Think about that for a mass education. Basically, Shatter comes to realize that you can systematize and you can run through big numbers. You can have 150 kids in a Lancasterian school, which he actually did when he was for a time in Detroit, when Detroit was a, a um, remote frontier settlement. If you've got all those kids, what do you do? How do you measure their progress? So the next thing we know, Jarvis uh, Shattuck is living in Concord and he's on the school committee and he's promoting that the school teacher, every school teacher should have an attendance book with every child listed in there, with how many days they were present, how many times they were late, tardy, how many times they were absent, what they were studying, what their progress was. And then there would be, this was a traditional thing, not a reform, exhibitions in which the parents could see all the kids perform. And there would be systematic uh, assessment of the spending in the school. Shattuck ends up inventing the school report as a document that both gauges the progress of the kids and promotes the school. This is no child left behind starting out in 1820, 1830s Concord. And from this, you can see this, he had the soul of a school superintendent. Yeah. And Jarvis is doing a similar thing going to the storekeepers in Concord and, and the innkeepers and saying, can you tell us how much you, you um, how many gallons of, of um, ardent spirits you sold? How much wine did you sell? Could you compare 1828 to 1832? And let's figure out how much drinking there is. And so, they're, and, but why would they do that with drinking? Well, the temperance societies are intent on gathering up pledges from every citizen in town to sign their name and say, I will abstain. And the societies that are doing this are measuring their progress by how many signatures they get and how much money do they raise in contributions. We've just finished the Christmas season where we've all gotten just before the tax year ended, numerous um, appeals for our money by large scale bureaucracies that are telling us um, how they succeeded by numbers. So what we see here is 
in 1820s, 1830s, Concord and in New England and in the North, we're watching the rise of mass society, mass politics, big political parties, big parades in the streets of the cities, mass conventions with delegates. We're seeing this in one sphere of life after another, and you get two reactions. One is transcendentalism. Emerson doesn't care about masses, he cares about individuals, and he fears that individuals are absorbed in the mass. But then you've got Shattuck and Jarvis, who in one sense pick up on the democracy of the age. Think about Tocqueville suggesting that instead of ranks and orders, democracy destroys that chain of being and every unit is equal in the mass. And so they'll count individuals, but grouping them in large scale groups, um, uh, collectivities to generalize about. So Concord, I'm suggesting in the book, is the birthplace of two things at once. Individualism and the focus on the individual as the basic unit of society. And two, large-scale statistics in the management of a mass society. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I think the book is always trying to give us at least two sides of a picture. One in which individualism is on the rise, and one in which community and communalism is on the decline. Um, I wondered if you could, we have about 10 minutes, and so I wanna invite people to, to um, put any questions they have into the Q&A, but I wanted to invite you to read the, the last section that um, is, I will confess, one of my favorites. Well, thank you. So I'm describing here Thoreau's choice to live as, in quotes, a hermit at Walden Pond. And I say here that his, for all its personal origins, Thoreau's experiment at Walden could not avoid public notice. And I skip ahead a few lines here and say, um, the writer's retreat attracted curiosity for its defiance of a fundamental rule of social life in Concord. Nobody lived alone. Nobody, that is, with any choice in the matter. In 1837, Thoreau graduated from college and returned home. Only a dozen in, 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 in 1837 when he returned home, only a dozen individuals in a town of 2000 lived alone. Nearly all of them were widows without children at hand to care for them. Such as Sarah Hollowell, 65, eking out a scanty existence on the worn out land Thoreau was all set to buy. And Eunice P. Wyman, an intrepid woman who had farmed successfully for several decades with the aid of two sons and a daughter until they scattered to the winds. And even she had brothers down the road. Just one man was in the same situation, Tommy Wyman, no kin to Eunice, whom the literary hermit of Walden was glad to succeed on the land. Had Thoreau stayed on that lot long enough to be enumerated, on the 1850 federal census, he would have raised the roster of solitary souls in Concord that year to four. Undoubtedly to his satisfaction, he would have been in the same company as Elisha Dugan, the man of wild habits, the writer had memorialized in his poem, The Old Marlboro Road. That's wonderful. And of course, Thoreau was, was back at home uh, in 1850 when the census taker right. came. I, you know, as a as a professional, I I admire both the the literary quality of that, and also just the kaleidoscopic view it gives us on Thoreau's activity um, in its context. That not more than twelve people lived alone when he when he came back from college, and that they were mostly widows who didn't have others to to care for them. Um, it's a really, it's a really extraordinary contrast that's being, that's being figured there, and I'm so grateful for it. I wanted to ask you the the last word in this book. It's a long book. Uh, is the word book, um, and you've been one of the the sort of chief boosters and even architects of the practice of the history of the book in America, both with the volume that you edited with. Mary Kelly, but also here you're you're focusing on 
libraries and, and, other, and other reading um, habits. Do you want to say a little bit about that enterprise, how, how that enterprise has, has influenced your work? Yeah, so I got into the history of the book as a field when it was emerging with David Hall and the American Antiquarian Society in the lead. I got into it because in the mid 80s, there was a lot of emphasis among literary scholars as well as historians um, on the fact that authors didn't just write texts. They wrote for audiences of magazines and books. And that if we were going to understand what they were up to, we would need to take into account the broad publishing framework of their writings and their lives. And so that was actually my initial excuse for moving into another field and getting deeply involved in it. Um, in my book, you can see my, so I give a detailed account of Emerson's publishing lecturing career. He, he gave lect he wrote lectures which he read before he revised them for essays that were published in books that he played the key role for himself in initiating in his discussions with publishers. Thoreau was a lecturer who um, was less successful and widely known than Emerson, but nonetheless ended up with an audience and he struggled to find outlets in magazines. And at the heart of this really is for Emerson and Thoreau, if they want to be true to their own principles, how to live lives of integrity, live simply and yet richly, take advantage of the opportunities of the 19th century while avoiding contamination by its exploitation and oppression, how can they do that? Well, can they write and make a living? You know, to understand how and why that's a dilemma is to understand much that it's the heart of Thoreau's experiment in Walden. To understand that for Emerson, and this very briefly come back to the question you answered me that I hadn't finished addressing before. For Emerson, he writes these lectures in Concord that he takes to market in Boston. And when he does that in 1837 and after, he takes as his central theme, the individual as the basic unit of society. And he does that at the very moment that he throws off any institutional sponsorship and becomes an entrepreneur of his own lectures. And so you suddenly see there um, that Emerson's individualism is rooted in his own personal experience and challenges, something I might not have thought about had I had not been working on the history of literary institutions and publishing uh, outlets. Yeah, thank you. We have only a minute or two left, so this is going to be the final, final question. Um, this is a this is a book that has taken shape in its research and its writing over a, a very long time. Um, and you write towards the end of the preface that um, that while you wrote the bulk of these pages, which is a, a nod to the first sentence of Walden. <laughs> While you wrote the bulk of these pages over the past few years, that Concord in the mid 19th century has come to look a lot like to you, um, or uncannily close to the United States in our own times. What did you? What do you mean by that? And how? How has that influenced you? Well, a broad theme of the book involves the separation of people out from a common way of life into enclaves of some of um, you know just distinct interests other as enclaves of mutual suspicion, um, people pulling apart from one another, social classes not really ever engaging one another. That's one key theme. Second is that my account of the coming of popular democracy to Concord turns out to have revealed an extraordinary amount of um, polarization, anti-Masonic uprising that rests upon conspiracy theories, um, not the only set of things. Um, politicians in town threatening one another, one of the prominent politicians doing everything he can to close down free speech when he just disapproves of what's being said. Um, so that, in fact, I, the more I've reflected on this, I think there's an essay I, I need to write, that every major advance in communications and political democracy has brought with it conspiracy theories and popular populist politics 
and attacks on elites and the like. Um, I even found instances of voter fraud in Concord and people, you know, shouting down their opponents at town meeting. You look, it's just a small scale and they still, a lot of them treat each other as neighbors. But you can see an embryo when, when the editor of the Concord newspaper announces that he's carrying pistols on the street in case anybody attacks him. We're talking about a world where people see each other pretty big divides from one another. That theme is important to the book, but so is the counter thrust. That is Ezra Ripley's ideology of interdependence, that no one lives alone, that we need one another to get by, is also a major thrust in our lives. How do we combine individualism with a sense of interdependence and connection? In the world that Emerson's step-grandfather knew, interdependence and inclusion went along with hierarchy and homogeneity. We're trying to build a world where we foster individual development and a sense of connection to others. But with pluralism and equality that we haven't ever seen before. So I do think the book raises the question to reflect on, can you have both in a setting of democratic equality? I think that's a wonderful question to end on. It's your question. It's an animating question in this wonderful book. I hope that uh, our viewers tonight will go to the seminary co-op either uh, in person or are um, online, uh, use the discount code SHARE uh, and order a copy. So thank you again, Bob, for being such a wonderful inaugural guest for us. Well, thank you. And to the people who have questions that we didn't get to, if you want to email me at robert.gross at uconn.edu, I'll be happy to answer that. Okay. Thank you so much. Good night. Thanks.